After the recent and unfortunate death of Satoru Iwata, his accomplishments have been celebrated all over the world. Besides being president of Nintendo and HAL Laboratory, he was a programmer for legendary games like Balloon Fight and Earthbound, and shaped iconic series like Kirby's Dream Land. While president of Nintendo, he brought us the Game Boy Advance, DS, GameCube, Wii, Wii U, and he pushed for Nintendo to expand into new markets. He has constantly been pushing Nintendo to take risks, innovate, include new audiences, and focus on fun. I could go on all day, but we're here to learn how games work, right? So let's go back to his days as a programmer when he worked on Pokemon Gold and Silver. This story has been told often as of late. The team didn't think they could fit new areas outside of Johto with the Game Boy Color's limited memory. But Iwata swooped in with his humble badassery and redid the entire project to fit the Kanto region of the previous red and blue games in one cartridge. Now that sounds impressive, but what does it really mean? What was actually required to cram everything in there? Let's find out. To understand this amazing feat of programming, let's look at how Game Boy games were made. Game Boy programming was done entirely in assembly code, which offers great control over memory, but is hard to work with. Many of your favorite consoles were developed for in assembly, from the NES to the PlayStation 2. Most modern games are made in C++, because it's a language that's much easier for programmers to read while offering similar levels of performance. However, C++ is eventually translated into assembly when the game runs, and assembly is translated into zeros and ones, or bits, which are then translated into low and high voltages that are processed in the hardware circuitry. That sounds pretty crazy and confusing, because it is, so let's frame it in a different way. Let's say you use tools like Game Maker or Unity to create games. This would be called high-level programming. The next level down would be using a modern language like Python, Ruby, or C++, which are actually all written in C. C is then translated into assembly language. There are many different assembly languages which vary with the processor and hardware you're working with. This is called low-level programming. Your computer's hardware reads these assembly instructions as zeros and ones that are represented as voltages that run through your circuits. Different developers work at different levels for different reasons, but Iwata and the programmers of Pokemon Gold and Silver were living in this area. In order to deeply understand something like Game Boy programming, developers not only had to know how to code in assembly, but understand what was going on down to the circuits of the processor. So let's talk about low-level programming. Zeros and ones make up binary code, which can seem very mystical at first. Basically, any number can be represented by zeros and ones. This is the core of computers and how they work. For example, this is nine. Basically, each digit represents a power of two. You add up the digits with ones, and so here we have two to the three plus two to the zero, we get nine. Let's think about how this applies to games. If we can represent any number with zeros and ones, then we could see how something like your score or your health points could be pretty obviously processed. But what about some of the less obvious aspects of games, like dialogue? How are all these words and letters processed into zeros and ones? Well, words are a collection of characters which have a numerical encoding, which tells the system what coordinates of pixels to display. And this is similar to how characters and sprites work too. Everything just boils down to zeros and ones. The next question is, how do we modify these values? How do we subtract from our health when we get hit and add to it when we drink a potion? Well, this is what assembly instructions do, and we're gonna break down how you can tell a computer to do something with just a stream of zeros and ones. So here we have three registers, which are kind of like little memory buckets. Register one holds the value five, register two has the value one, and register three has the value 200. These could be anything, but for now, we are just going to add them together. 
So what this assembly instruction means is add the values of one and two and set three to be those values. So you see it no longer holds 200. It now holds five plus one equals six. And today we are going to be using MIPS assembly language, which was used in the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 2, and it's a highly recommended beginner's language. And right up top, we have the binary encoding for the MIPS instruction we have written below, and you can see that it's actually broken into many different parts that contain all the information the system needs to know to execute that instruction. The first and last sections are the opcode, which basically just designates what we want it to do, whether it's add, subtract, multiply, divide, and then in one and in two are the two inputs we want to add, and then we have our destination, which is what we want to overwrite, register three. All games and software run on complex combinations of simple commands like adding, subtracting, load, save, and an or, but regardless if any of this is making sense or not, you can see that assembly is hard. And perhaps even harder is understanding the circuits that make all of this work. Basically, circuits are a series of gates that turn zeros and ones on and off. This can be simple to understand, but real calculations can get incredibly complex. You can probably imagine that Iwata and the rest of the dev team were pretty badass for programming at this level. However, the question still remains, what did Iwata have to do to fit Kanto into Pokemon Gold and Silver? To answer this, let's take a quick look at how memory works. We'll focus on RAM or random access memory and disk memory, which in this case is the cartridge's memory. Think of RAM as what you have available to use at any given moment. Let's say your computer's RAM allows you to display exactly two objects on the screen at once, but the entire game you downloaded has six objects. In modern games, for example, you might see trees or bushes in the distance pop in and out of your view due to the limitations of RAM and how much it can show at one. Most of today's AAA games require about four to eight gigabytes of RAM to run smoothly and take up to 50 gigabytes of memory in disk space. In comparison, the Game Boy Color had about 16 to 32 kilobytes of RAM and could be about a thousand kilobytes of cartridge space. To put that in perspective, most modern games have about 250,000 times more RAM and about 50,000 times more disk space to work with. With all the limitations of the Game Boy Color, they had to be very careful about what memory they used and how they used it. And while there are many techniques for compressing memory that are used in code today, one thing that low-level programmers especially have to worry about is memory alignment. If you remember, our MIPS instruction had 32 zeros and ones, or 32 bits, and there are eight bits in one byte. So that was a four byte instruction. It's very common for machines to align things by four or eight bytes. To show how small this is, if the average pop song is about four megabytes, then that has 10,000 times more memory. This just shows the small scale they were working on and how every little number mattered. So the machine only understands things that are in chunks of four bytes. And these four bytes could be an integer or a number representing your score or health. It can be the MIPS instruction. It could be anything. But let's say we want to add something onto those four bytes. Let's say we want to add a letter. Well, now the alignment is off. It doesn't understand this. So it needs to add some padding, even though that's just wasted space. Good memory management means minimizing this wasted space. Perhaps there are other letters floating around in memory that you could stick in there and save some space. It's like figuring out an extraordinarily complicated puzzle of where everything can fit together. And I'm sure to pull off Pokemon Gold and Silver, Iwata had to be working down to the last bite, making sure everything fit together perfectly and beautifully. So if you already thought his Pokemon achievements were already impressive, well now you understand a lot more about why Satoru Iwata was a total badass 
programmer. If you're interested in learning more about this, check out my tutorial about programming in MIPS for yourself. But in the end, this video is meant to honor Satoru Iwata, the man, the legend, and one of my personal inspirations. He will truly be missed.